Good morning, and thank you for joining today's fireside chat with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Undersecretary for Rural Development, Xochitl Torres Small. Um, I'm Andy Winkler, the director of BPC's Housing and Infrastructure Project. I help in leading the work of BPC's J. Ronald Williger Center for Housing Policy, which was founded in late 2021 to advance the goal of a safe, decent, and affordable home for every American family. Um, we're so thrilled today to have Undersecretary Torres Small for the fourth conversation in our Housing Leaders Speaker Series, uh, which is intended to spotlight leaders from across the political spectrum and the housing sector who really recognize and champion housing as one of the most powerful tools that we have to drive economic prosperity. Um, Under Secretary Torres Small is uniquely positioned for this discussion as she oversees a variety of programs at USDA, which are not only intended to build and improve rural housing, but to build and improve nearly every possible type of infrastructure critical to making a home part of a vibrant and thriving community. Um, she was confirmed by the Senate to serve as the Undersecretary for Rural Development in October 2021. Uh, and in the time since, has overseen USDA rural development and the really significant new resources it has received in the bipartisan infrastructure law and the, the Inflation Reduction Act, including uh, over $2 billion to support rural broadband around the country. Um, just last month, President Biden announced he would be nominating the Undersecretary to serve as the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, congratulations. Um, for perspective, that's, you know, the number two job in a department with an over $200 billion budget uh, that serves a really wide range of functions, um, ensuring food safety, providing nutrition benefits to American families, protecting our nation's national forests, and supporting our nation's farmers. Um, prior to coming to rural development, Undersecretary Torres Small was a U.S. representative from New Mexico where she served on the House Agriculture Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, and as chairwoman of the Oversight Management and Accountability Subcommittee of the House Homeland Security Committee. She was the first woman and the first person of color to represent her district in New Mexico. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention that during her time in Congress, she really fostered a reputation for working across the aisle and that sort of made her a sought after target for BBC projects and events, including participating in America, uh, BBC's American Congressional Exchange Program, uh, where she visited Representative, Representative Brian Stile, a Republican from Wisconsin's district, met his constituents and was able to find some common ground. Um, so finally, she is the granddaughter of farm workers and grew up in New Mexico and has worked a variety of other roles before she came to Congress, including working for her then Senator Tom Udall, a clerk uh, for a U.S. District Court judge and an attorney in practicing water and natural resources law. Um, so I think I got everything in the bio, um, but thank you again for being here um, under Secretary. Um, and just one quick announcement for everybody watching um, online, you can leave a question at any time in the YouTube chat or tweet at us uh, at BBC underscore bipartisan or using hashtag BBC live. I will be tracking the questions and um, we will leave some time at the end of the program to ask um, as well. Um, so with that, I, I, I think I covered most everything, um, but I would love to just just to kick us off here a little bit more about you generally, about your work at USDA, and in particular, what has driven your passion for rural housing issues, rural issues generally, and what makes you kind of most excited about the platform that you have to drive policy change. So thank you. Andy, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for fostering this conversation and so many conversations like it. I, I truly have experienced the Bipartisan Policy Center as being uh, very focused on bringing people together and finding common ground, and uh, that's why I was glad to have this conversation today. I, I really appreciate you mentioning that I'm from New Mexico, and that certainly is where my roots and when it comes to uh, a sense of what 
what rural can be and also the, the value of agriculture comes from. You mentioned my grandparents immigrated from Mexico uh, to pick cotton. And so I know the opportunities that exist in ag and in rural places because of that. That's why I get to be undersecretary for rural development in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, it also, where I grew up, is also a persistent poverty county. Doñana County uh, has, has experienced real challenges and a fundamental part of that is housing, access to adequate housing. Uh, and so I've seen the impacts that that has on a, a family's ability to thrive on children's decision, whether or not to stay in the area or leave home and search for more opportunity, and on the ability to recruit new businesses or support new workforces uh, if you don't have that housing stock that's crucial. Uh, they, in addition, it can exacerbate other challenges. So uh, in the midst of COVID, the challenges that normal healthcare providers in rural areas face in recruiting new healthcare providers were made even worse because it was hard to get folks to places where there weren't enough uh, suitable housing in the region in order to, to attract that workforce. Uh, and then of course, you, you see even more challenges if, if you don't also have the basic infrastructure that exists like high-speed internet or running water or wastewater services. That's the thing that I truly appreciate about rural development is that it recognizes all of the ingredients necessary to support a thriving community in rural places. So everything is basic to electricity, uh, which is how the, the roots of rural development are in the Rural Electrification Act from the 1930s, all the way to high-speed internet, and then investing in individual rural businesses to help them thrive. Great. So I, uh, a, a lot of folks watching today, I think will be pretty familiar with USDA's different programs, um, but maybe you could walk through a little bit more about, you know, what falls under your purview um, and the top priorities that you have made for uh, USDA rural development in your time, um, and also how those duties and responsibilities will shift, uh, you know, if and when you are confirmed as Deputy Secretary. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so the we used to say at Rural Development that we could literally build a town from the ground up. And, and what that means is everything from the rural utility service, which is where our elect electricity, our uh, water and wastewater, and our, as well as telecommunications and high-speed internet is located, to community facilities, as which is uh, a library or a school or a hospital, as well as, uh, in many cases, uh, other government-run or nonprofit-run services, uh, facilities, uh, as well as housing in the Rural Housing Service. And then lastly, the Rural Business and Cooperative Service, which does loans and guaranteed loans to uh, rural businesses, uh, value-added producer grants for farms, as well as uh, a whole assortium, uh, assortia of uh, programs that support rural cooperatives, for example. Uh, so it, in, in many ways, it does truly build from the ground up, but the distinction is, is that it's, we have the tools. We're like a Swiss army knife that has all of the different tools that allow you to do the work, but that doesn't truly get the job done unless you also have a blueprint, what a community's vision is for itself, how to best use those rural assets and invest in a town and its people. Uh, and through that, we've been working to support our people to help identify those visions. Uh, Rural development is pretty unique, as is USDA, and that we have people living in the communities we serve. And that makes a whole difference when it comes to being more accessible to rural people and when it comes to making sure that our tools really do fit and serve the purpose. Uh, recently, we announced the Rural Partners Network, which is another way to invest in place-based work, locating more individuals in specific places uh, that have faced significant challenges, but also have a real network of uh, nonprofits and other organizations that are working hard to uh, bring that vision of their community to a reality. So it's not just about the tools that we have, but it's also about uh, the place-based work and helping uh, define and then go after a vision. So you mentioned all of the different tools that you have. How do they apply to some of the kind of unique challenges that we're facing in this moment? You know, when we think about housing affordability or lack thereof around the country, you know, on we have a, a too limited supply of housing, uh, homes for both rent and for sale, uh, particularly for entry-level homeownership. Uh, we're in a climate of rising rates that makes it, already unaffordable housing, even more unaffordable to purchase. 
Um, and in some communities, particularly rural communities, we have a lot of older and inadequate quality housing, uh, substandard housing. Uh, can you give us an idea of sort of the unique challenges that Americans living in, in sort of rural and tribal communities um, that USDA programs target, how they apply these tools, some of which have not changed all that much over the years um, to uniquely meet the needs of this moment? You described the challenges incredibly well. And in, in rural places, uh, it can have a multiplying effect. So I, I was in Mississippi fairly early on when I served as uh, serving as undersecretary. And I, I met a woman who had moved from a city to be closer to her family. But the only place that she could find uh, that, that would, was affordable to her had a hole in the roof and didn't have a restroom. And so she worked to try to find funds to make these improvements because uh, new construction was just out of the question. The cost of new construction of one standalone facility uh, was just way too expensive, in part because uh, developers aren't uh, investing in rural places in the same way, and it's more expensive to get materials out there. So she knew she had to make what she had work. Um, she received funds to help with through 504, one of our programs, uh, to help repair some of her house, but it took of an incredibly long time. And so she was living in a place that, that was not adequate and there were no other options to be in her home in her childhood uh, town. So those are the kinds of challenges that people face. And it shows an incredible dedication to place and to family to be willing to put up with that uh, as you try to find a, a way forward. In addition, uh, those challenges are made even worse in, in the midst of a disaster. So in my home state of New Mexico, there were just incredible, incredibly destructive fires uh, in Northern New Mexico that impacted uh, tons of people's homes. And uh, again, there's a challenge with construction, getting folks out to do new developments, to construct one home is just much more expensive than uh, a, a development in the suburbs that uh, has a whole, whole neighborhoods of homes, right? So it just becomes a much more expensive issue uh, but it's also a challenge uh, to fit and to qualify for our programs. Honestly, uh, especially in the wake of the disaster, we had lots of folks coming uh, seeking our help, uh, but our household income limits, they were just out of reach of those household uh, income limits. And, and that reinforces that the problem is uh, much harder uh, and much bigger than, than just the, the way we've described what's affordable. Um, and, and that's going to be a challenge moving forward as we identify what, how do we support, uh, for example, how do we make more workforce housing available where the income is going to be higher than what our current programs serve. Uh, and then lastly, it's about making sure that we have a real safety net for the folks who need the support the most. And that's our multifamily housing program. The average person, the typical renter in our multifamily housing program is uh, a senior citizen who's living almost entirely on social security. So it's an incredibly low and fixed income, but it's also folks who want to age in place and don't necessarily have other options, certainly not close to home. Uh, so the challenge is, is that so many of our properties, the properties that we've lent to help build in the multifamily housing program are quite old. They're getting to 35, 40 years old. One, that means they're about to pay off their mortgage that we've lent, which means that then they could exit the program and no longer be required to provide that affordable housing that so many people are relying on. Two, it means that a lot of them need uh, repairs and, and need investment to keep that, that uh, housing sustainable and, and in good quality. Uh, but we don't necessarily have the funds to lend for preservation or to grant for preservation. And so the president's budget has dramatically increased the request, the amount for those preservation funds. And we certainly see it as a, a wise investment for the people who need it most all across rural America. Great. You... Um... You, you preempted kind of one of my questions, which is, you know, here at BBC, and I mentioned that our mission is um, at the Twilliger Center really is to, to realize the, the aspirational goal that every American family has a, a safe, decent, and affordable home. Um, and the way that we look at this problem or, or look at this goal and how to achieve it, we see kind of a, a three-pronged approach. Um, on the one side, you have to grow the supply of housing that we have in this country. We have a, a, a severe housing supply shortage, and that leads to so many different issues. 
Um, so one, the, the supply of housing, we also need to preserve the affordable housing that we have. Um, and then third, kind of help families uh, who don't have the incomes to, to afford housing um, be able to pay the rent. Um, and, and you touched on the second kind of prong of that piece, which is, is preservation. And I, I know that has been a significant focus at USDA because so many of the, the USDA financed rental properties that we do have in this country, the stock of USDA financed multifamily, um, it's getting older and deteriorating. And we don't necessarily have all of the tools that we need to preserve that really critical stock of affordable housing. Um, so you mentioned in the president's budget, you know, calling for additional funding to help with preservation, but what other sort of um, tools or, you know, things could, could USDA have authorities funding uh, focus to, to really be successful in helping to preserve that really critical stock of, of affordable housing in rural communities? So grants for preservation are a crucial part of it. And so we've seen that in terms of the president's request for, for additional funds. In addition, uh, looking at helping with the sale of these properties. So if there's the, the previous borrower is no longer interested in managing the profit, the, the uh, facility, but there's a nonprofit that wants to now take on this challenge, being able to, to resell it to a new entity is, is a great opportunity. Then that extends our partnership and also then therefore the, avail the availability of rental assistance. Uh, to do that, it takes a staff who are going to write all of those contracts and do those negotiations uh, and, then, and then make the sale. And that is one of the challenges that rural development faces is just not having necessarily the people to do all of those transfers in a, in a quick matter of time as we see these properties starting to age out of the system. Uh, then the other, but, but that is one of the crucial components for retaining this housing stock um, to keep affordable rental homes in rural places. Another option as we try to do that as quickly as possible is to what we call decouple the rental assistance. And so, so what that means is when we've lent money to build a multifamily housing property in the past, an apartment building in the past, as long as they are paying back that money for the construction, we provide rental assistance for specific units where people who live there make less than what's considered an affordable rent for that unit. And so we cover the difference. So if a senior, if, if someone's grandma is living with just her social security and she can't afford to pay a higher rent, we provide rental assistance for her in addition to having funded the building of the apartment. Um, but as soon as they pay off the loan for building that apartment, the rental assistance goes away. And so the president's budget has included a sort of wonky fix, which is if it was built with rural development money, let them continue to receive rental assistance, even if they're no longer paying back the cost for building it, uh, for building the apartment building. And, and that provides an opportunity, especially as we work to get more grants and loans out for preservation and then to fix up the apartment building, and then also working to help facilitate sales uh, to new, new nonprofits or other entities that are willing to manage the apartment building in the future. Great. Um, I, so one piece of that that you did mention was, was staff. And I think one of the really interesting things about USDA that uh, is sort of underappreciated is that you do have um, staff and offices in all 50 states around the country and a really long history working closely hand in hand with, with the communities that your programs serve. Um, so USDA is sort of uniquely positioned to drive change and growth in, in rural America. Um, so I'm curious how the agency has worked to sort of foster, you know, that sort of trusted, productive position with the stakeholders that you serve and how it can help or is already helping uh, you to further some of the administration's goals, for example, around housing, um, racial equity. Uh, I know you've been, you've focused a lot on, on climate resilience and disaster resilience and, and economic goals more broadly. 
Yeah, I, I used to say that uh, USDA is a bit of a dinosaur in the federal government and that we have people in uh, all 50 states in, uh, in in many places. We have over 460 uh, state and area offices all across the country. And one of my state directors said, we're not a dinosaur, we're a unicorn. Uh, and, and I like that description better, but it is truly one of my favorite things about rural development is that we have people who are from rural places, who love their home and who are invested in making sure that other people who love their home can stay there and also choose their best opportunities. And, and you see it in all sorts of ways. So with the Rural Partners Network, for example, when Eastern Kentucky was hit with those massive floods last year, uh, our Rural Partners Network employee who was from that community, whose uh, family, some of their, her family had, had uh, was, was in threat of losing their housing, she was out going door to door, talking to neighbors and making sure folks knew what programs we had and also how to interact with FEMA to get the support that they need and get all of the information that they needed. And having someone that they already knew on the ground really facilitated, helped build that relationship and, and uh, establish some level of trust with, with FEMA and with other agencies who are coming in to provide support. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we feel we can be rural experts for the whole federal government uh, and help facilitate, help make sure that we're not just talking about our programs in the future, but through the Rural Partners Network, we're also talking about other federal programs or other state or local programs that might also uh, support people in rural areas. It, it can be challenging though, when, when we don't have the team that we need. I uh, was in Washington recently and was talking to uh, an employee who came from banking and chose rural development because she wanted to help people who needed it most have an affordable place to live. And she, so she, the mission truly drives her. But one of the most challenging situations is knowing that because we have really old technology in our systems, uh, you have to deal with a paper application for to, to provide assistance to help fix your home. Uh, and then you have to take that application and put it into multiple different databases because none of our databases talk to each other. So while she's doing all of this really intense manual work, even though she's got the ability to be doing, you know, much, much more sophisticated, you know, and much more work. She's thinking about everybody who's on that list waiting to get access to an affordable home and the, all of the multiple steps that it's taking her that are keeping her from being able to support more, for, more folks. So in addition to having the staff that we need to do this work, it's also about investing in the technology that we need to do this work as efficiently as possible. Um, so, I mean, Two kind of really significant uh, pieces of legislation have passed that direct resources to your agency, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Re Reduction Act. Um, I, you did mention staff um, and some of the challenges you face being understaffed in so many of the, the places that you serve. But, um, you know, how has that affected the implementation of these really significant uh, pieces of legislation? Um, could you provide just a little update on some of the implementation efforts? Congress did something really interesting with both of these laws, and they provided a certain percentage of the, um, the funding that we received to be used for administrative purposes. And, and that's truly been helpful in planning and making sure that we have the team necessary to distribute these funds. Uh, because what we've seen in the past is, although the amount of money that we've been asked to get out uh, to rural America has increased, the amount for salaries and expenses has stayed flat. Uh, and especially with increased uh, with inflation or increased salaries, uh, in, in many ways, that means the number of people that we can have has had to decline. So we've seen Congress take this, this different approach when it comes to these historic investments in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which recognizes that it takes a great team in order to get out meaningful investments. Uh, and, and as a result, we've been able to do some really important things. We've been able to stand up a technical assistance branch with the Rural, rural Utilities Service. So one of the most painful questions that I get from Congress or, uh, or when I'm visiting a rural community is someone saying, you know, hey, I live in a rural community. 
I don't have high speed internet and my neighbor does. What do I have to do to get, I'm right next door. I am less than a mile away. What do I have to do to get internet? And the challenge is, is uh, working to make sure that a community has the negotiating power to talk with internet service providers to get them to cover bigger areas. Uh, that can be a real challenge because the internet service provider is, is often looking at what's profitable or what's affordable to invest in. So with these new uh, technical, with this new technical assistance branch at Rural Utility Service, they can help communities at that planning stage so that they can, one, try to have more productive conversations with internet service providers to have a sense of the plan for build out. Or if that's not going to work, work with their rural electric cooperative or work with uh, uh, the county to set up their own utility to provide high speed Internet. Uh, but that kind of work takes a lot of time, takes a lot of training, and, and that's why we're excited that the technical assistance branch will help do that work while also working with states and other federal agencies that are also distributing uh, the, the funds from this historic investment in high speed Internet. Great. I know um, I, it's something that BPC talks a lot about, not just in, in housing, but um, infrastructure, energy, um, other programs is that so often we, you know, it's the communities that need some of these programs the most who have trouble sort of navigating them, planning the projects that they need, figuring out exactly which uh, federal program would best serve those needs and then really deploying the resources in an effective and kind of impactful way. Um, so you, you spoke to it already a little bit, but because of the relationships that USD, USDA has in communities, um, how, how are you kind of mechanically being the, the expert or the resource to um, you know, states um, and local governments, as well as other members of sort of the federal family in particular, in helping be that bridge uh, between rural communities and the programs that could be most effective in helping them. I'll, I'll cite two examples that I think might illustrate the work. And the first I've, I've talked a little bit about, which is the bipartisan infrastructure law. So rural development received about $2 billion of the $65 billion for high-speed internet. And that, that's a, this is a smaller percentage, but uh, it's a really important percentage in terms of getting using an existing program that has uh, demonstrated results and, and making sure that it gets out as quickly as possible. Uh, so one of the ways that we coordinated was just being really clear about what our timelines were so that as other agencies or the states received their funding, they knew what our build out plan was going to be. Uh, then in addition, we, of course, uh, weekly uh, and as well as uh, in many cases daily at a staff level uh, are convening with our partners at FCC and NTIA uh, Treasury to talk through some of the, uh, the implementation. And then once we are figuring out how, once we've received ap applications, we go application by application about where there may be potential conflicts or overlap in funding and identifying where that might be and whether there is any place where intentionally it makes sense for the funding to cross over. If it doesn't make sense, then working to deconflict it. It, it takes working in a lot of details, uh, both forecasting what your plans are up front and then getting in the nitty gritty about applications. Uh, and that takes building strong relationships. Uh, we've really appreciated also the way as we've designed our technical assistance branch, branch to support individual communities, we've been able to work with NTIA that's designed another type of technical assistance to work with states. So now we have this way to facilitate uh, what the states are doing and have a really clear picture of what their plans are uh, and, and to better coordinate that with the communities and the technical assistance provided at that level. The other example is the Rural Partners Network, where in addition to more people on the ground in specific places, we're also working to have a federal table uh, where folks get together from over 20 different agencies uh, to talk about our rural policies. And a fundamental part of that is appointing desk officers from each of those agencies who are that agency or department's person on rural. And what that means is that it's not just in rural development where someone wakes up every single day and thinks, how can I better serve rural? That's across the federal government. And it provides us opportunity for a real learning environment where if we're hearing from the ground that our program is not doing what it's supposed to do, we've got the decision makers in the room working together to figure out how to do it better. 
Great. Um, and I will say uh, your office has very helpfully provided a whole list of, of USDA resources that are available to folks. So we'll make sure to share those uh, in the chat and later on um, so that, that folks are able to access some of the programs that you've mentioned and some of the technical assistance resources in particular. Um, and I do want to remind folks, we already have a, a couple of questions that have come in, um, but please do post any questions that you have in the chat. I'm going to turn to those in just a second. Um, but I, I, I did want to ask, because you have, you know, been a member of Congress uh, and you've been a staffer for a member of Congress, um, you know, you've seen kind of all aspects of working to pass legislation and now in your role at USDA, seeing that legislation implemented. I'm, I'm curious how your perspective has changed or if it's changed at all on what USDA can and should be able to achieve with respect to rural development and the programs that you have. Um, and how about economic development in, in tribal communities, which also uh, very often are served by USDA programs? Well, you ask the tribal communities after I answer the first yes. one, just in case I miss it, um, because yes. it's a really important one and I want to make sure I address it. Um, Andy, but so, thanks so much for the question about, about Congress. It's an interesting one, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the experience of both. Uh, in, in the House, so much of the conversation, and it's a really important conversation, was about what should we be doing? What should we, we be focusing on? We've got this historic COVID-19 pandemic. It's having all of these impacts on the economy. It's having all these impacts on health and on people. What should we be doing? And that takes a lot of uh, bipartisanship, it takes a lot of collaboration, and it takes a lot of um, uh, soul searching, frankly, to figure out what the best decision is. In the administration, so much of my time is spent on how. How should we be doing that what? And so that both that takes also a lot of soul searching in, in terms of what's the right way to get out these funds, to make sure that we are coordinating with uh, all the federal agencies and all the states. What's the right way to make sure that the money is going to the people who need it most and is being used as efficiently as possible? Uh, so, for example, uh, the, the difference in administration is you've got this bucket of money for each state, for example, for different programs. And what we've noticed is that there are some communities that are uh, persistently poor or high uh, on the distressed communities index, uh, and yet have gone more than five years without receiving any federal funds. So what we asked is for our state directors just to go out and uh, do outreach to them, to meet with those with, with representatives from those communities, talk about what their goals are, and provide some information about what our programs are. Just that, just that outreach, the how of how we distribute our funds had an impact in terms of where that money went. So from one year where zero money had been spent in those areas, we had over $150 million spent in those areas. So that's the impact in terms of how you choose to focus. Uh, the, so, so the how can be really fun, uh, but it can also be really challenging because while Congress is often focused on the what, if we lose sight of the how, uh, if we lose sight of the technology that's crucial to do the things that, are, that we're being charged with, the how of funding that, if we lose sight of the staff that's necessary to, to, to work in community the way we do, uh, then it, it can imperil the what. And, and that's the, the, the balance and the challenge uh, between the two. You asked about tri economic development in tribal communities. Yes. Do you, would you mind say, asking the question again? Yeah, I, so I think one sort of overlooked part of USDA's role is that there is a lot of overlap between um, you know, the programs that you have. And like you said, there are many um, tribal communities that are served by your programs as well. And I, I'm curious just how you think about sort of economic development in those communities. And in particular, um, you know, coming out of your experience in Congress and, and now at USDA, is there a way for uh, USDA programs to better serve tribal communities? Uh, there are real opportunities to better serve tribal communities. And, and I think because it's the bipartisan policy center, there are real leaders uh, in, uh, in both parties who are focused on this. Uh, I've really appreciated the work that Senator Smith and Senator Rounds have done when it comes to our 502 relending program and the uh, way that we've worked to overcome some of the challenges. So I'll use that as, as an example uh, and, and then make a larger point. 
So our 502 program is uh, for mortgages for single family housing uh, for folks who qualify who have are low income. Uh, so the the major um, the largest buyer of uh, or user of the the subsidized loans are as a single parent. Um, so one of the great things about this is that you can get a cheaper mortgage because you're borrowing through rural development or through rural development guaranteed. One of the challenging things is that in, in Indian country, trust lands become really complicated. Our federal rules don't really recognize or don't really acknowledge how to best work on trust land and fund houses there. So what we decided to do is to trust partners that are already on the ground and know how to navigate uh, some of the documentation and other challenges when it comes to working on trust land. So we relended our 502 funds to a native CDFI that then one already had relationships in Indian country and two knew how to navigate these issues. We had a dramatic increase in the number of mortgages that were made uh, in Indian country and specifically on trust land. So we've seen that it works if we are working closely with partners who know how to navigate some of these challenges. So that's one way that we can better address our uh, the issues that we face. But there are other challenges that are in the way our programs are designed. So who is eligible for our programs uh, can be more complicated when working with tribal governments or with arms of a tribal government. Uh, and, and getting in the details there in terms of what is allowed by statute and then what's allowed by our, by our regulations is really important to make sure that it's having an impact on the land and that people uh, from tribal, uh, tribal uh, nations and, and tribal governments themselves have equal access to our programs. Great, and that actually leads into, I think, uh really well into one of the questions that someone asked in the in the chat, which is, um, you know, how your agency is implementing the administration's Justice 40 initiative. Um, you know, many, their point, many disadvantaged communities get overlooked, specifically communities of color. Um, so curious your thoughts there. It's, it's a great question, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done. Uh, one of the, the things that I think is really interesting is that in the definition, uh, the president's definition of equity, it, it includes, in addition to uh, race and other components, it includes rurality, uh, recognizing that underserved often means people who are in rural places. And I think that's really important for folks to understand because sometimes when I think we talk about equity, folks don't realize that there's a that we're all part of that mix. And making sure that we reach uh, all different types of equity is crucial. Uh, when we look at the left behind of the left behind, the folks who are uh, have the biggest challenge accessing our funds, uh, we we know that we can do a better job in the places that need it most. And that's why we've created priority points for many of our programs uh, to identify where those places are. Uh, Reconnect is another great example of that, where we, one, had priority points. If you were in a, um, a, a distressed area, as defined uh, by our, our program, uh, or a disadvantaged area. But then we realized that wasn't enough because uh, also, even with priority points, they might be competing against folks who are better funded. So we made different pots of money. Some would be 100% loan if you were gonna be able to uh, pay off because of the population base and because of the income base of an area, you'd be able to pay off an investment. And then we went to 50-50, um, so half loan, half grant, uh, places where it could you, you needed a little bit of help to re reach that far. But then when it came to, we also gave 100% grant to certain communities, including tribal and persistently poor. Uh, so that way we were reaching the, the folks that needed it most with that strongest investment. Uh, and in some cases we put a set aside for tribes, for example, um, so that they weren't competing with others for those funds. Now, when it comes to Justice 40, which is an overlay between equity and our climate change goals, we uh, a great example is our REAP program, so the Rural Energy for America program. And we implement those priority points to make sure uh, that folks who apply uh, and, and need the support the most are able to do so. Um, so in addition to the structure of the program, it's also crucial that we have the right outreach and doing that outreach to socially disadvantaged farmers, for example, um, to make sure that they know about the energy savings opportunities that's available in REAP is another great way to, to make sure that we're um, reaching those goals. 
Great. Another question that came in. Um, so many rural areas are in red states where there is often little political political will to support programs aimed at low-income people. Um, I think there are exceptions to that, though um, uh, that's one of the questions that came in. How do you approach that conflict? Um, and USDA programs traditionally have had really broad bipartisan support, um, but but curious your thoughts. Yeah, and, and I, I do also agree there are certainly exceptions. Um, in the midst of COVID-19, for example, one of the most powerful allies I had when working uh, to make sure that tribes were adequately supported uh, with some of the challenges they were facing uh, was, was Dusty Johnson from South Dakota. Uh, so recognizing that we, we've got to find partners all across the spectrum in order to uh, serve folks who need it most. Uh, however, there are certainly places, regardless of their party, that uh, are not uh, paying the same attention or taking the same care when it comes to making sure that we're using our funds as efficiently as possible. So that's especially in, a pro in programs like those in rural development, where we can do loans as well as partial loans and partial grants and all grants, that we're scaling those in a way that, that uses it as effectively as possible, that folks who can repay do, and that we have grants where the need is especially great. Uh, we've seen that if we approach a community more holistically, for example, by providing planning funds for a community to identify their, um, their housing needs, then uh, communities are more uh, willing to acknowledge the mix of housing that's necessary. So then we can then support our tailor our programs to support whether it's um, finding other potential funding sources for the workforce housing that has higher incomes uh, versus uh, leveraging our programs as well as possible to achieve the low income housing. Because what we're seeing more and more is if rural communities truly want to thrive, you knew you do need that mixed income to support seniors who want to age in place, support single parent families, as well as uh, to have the, the higher end housing for, to sustain a, a tourism investment, for example. But it's approaching that more holistically that, that creates that response. One of the best examples of that um, was in Franklin, New Hampshire, I, I visited and heard the mayor tell that exact story about how a planning grant they received from us allowed them to re-envision their community. And they were really suffering. And they realized that they were an old mill town they were there because of the river and they wanted to still be there because of the river. So they invested in all of these water features for their river. They invested in rebuilding their main street, ultimately attracted a main street um, business that sold kayaks. But in order to sustain that tourism, they also knew that they needed lower income housing as well. So their housing plan was quite robust and we were able to be partners in some of that work. So I think as if we approach communities more holistically about what their goals are, I think folks are more willing to see how investments across the board and in the communities and low income people that need it most are a fundamental part of that strategy. Great, so we are about out of time already. Um, I did wanna end on, on one question. If you had any sort of final departing thoughts, words of wisdom about, um, about public service, about being a leader, um, uh, you know, you've had a, a, a remarkable career already on the Hill and now in a federal agency, moving potentially up in that federal agency. You know, maybe you could share any sort of words of wisdom you have for, for folks who are interested in a career in public service. Thank you, Andy. I really appreciate that. Um, I think the, the more I do, the more I realize I don't know. And one of my favorite things about being a leader is that I get to ask questions and I'm surrounded by experts all of the time, whether it's an expert who works in our rural utilities service, who is in charge of uh, designing what our program will look like or implementing the Inflation Reduction Act, or whether it's somebody living in a rural place who knows their town better than anyone else. Everyone's an expert in something and being a leader is, is partly about discovering what that is and learning from it. Great. Um, so we are out of time, but um, thank you so much for joining us under Secretary Torres Small. Um, and to the folks watching at home, please, please stay in touch. Watch uh, if you're not already signed up for BBC's new newsletter or housing newsletter, please do so. We, we do events quite frequently and hope you'll follow along with us. Um, 
So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Undersecretary. Andy, thanks so much. Have a good one.